from the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalists. I'm Jason McClure. If you think of what kind of a journalist has a dangerous job, you might think of someone who is a war correspondent or maybe someone who covers drug cartels in a place like Mexico. But one job you might not think of is reporters covering the environment. Now, in the last decade, as many as 29 reporters have been killed for working on environmental stories all around the globe. And one of the most dangerous things to report on for environmental journalists, especially in developing nations, is the mining industry. Mining interests in places like Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa have long been associated with paying off local officials and using their own security forces against local people seen as threatening. Now, efforts to silence the local journalists who report on these issues in places like Colombia or Liberia are not unusual either. And that's where the Forbidden Stories Project comes in. Now, this is a collective of international journalists who try to follow up on the reporting of reporters who have been silenced, either because they've been killed, jailed, or just found that a story was too dangerous to report. So this year, this Forbidden Stories Collective has released a series of stories for a project called Green Blood, following up on the stories of local reporters who are threatened or even killed for their work on the environment. So on this edition of Global Journalist, a closer look at the unexpectedly high number of threats to environmental journalists. To kick things off, we're going to be joined by Laurent Richard in France. He's a French journalist and the founder of the Forbidden Stories Project. He oversaw this Green Blood reporting initiative. Laurent, welcome. Hi, hello. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. I just I want to ask you about the origin of uh, the Forbidden Stories Project. I understand that uh, several years ago, back in 2015, you worked in the same office building in Paris that housed the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. As many of our listeners may recall, gunmen uh, who claimed allegiance to al-Qaeda attacked uh, the Charlie Hebdo magazine, killed uh, a dozen people and injured many more. How did How did that sort of lead to where you are now? Well, I, I'm an investigative journalist for 20 years, and I was used to film violence or to, to report in countries where freedom of the press were not really existing. But what happened in January 2015 in Paris, in the building uh, of my offices, uh, changed really my, la my life. This day, I arrived just after the terrorists escaped the building. And with all the people of my previous company, we, we did our best to help the survivors. And really that day changed a lot of things for me because from that day I decided to commit much more myself and, uh, and trying to answer one question, what I can do as a journalist to keep stories alive, to continue the work of assassinated or jailed reporters. And this is why I decided to create it, this consortium Forbidden Stories with the help and with the collaboration of talentous investigative reporters in the world to continue the work together as a collaborative force to continue the work of the assassinated, jail or under threat reporters in the world. And I understand that actually you drew some inspiration uh, for this project from the killing of an American journalist in Arizona back in the 1970s. Talk to us about that. Yeah, in 1976, um, um, a reporter called Dawn Bowles in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, one morning he was supposed to meet one source. And when he started to drive his car, he was killed in a bomb explosion of his, of his car. And so the day after, 30 reporters from all over the U.S. decided to join forces to continue the work of Don Bowles. And that project was called a name, the, the Arizona Project. So in the history of journalism, this is a... And sorry, and John Bowles, he had been investigating the, he had been investigating the mafia. He had been investigating organized crime. Correct. Don Bowles was investigative corruption. And as many reporters 40 years after are dying and have been killed because they are investigating the same kind of stories of Don Bowles, uh, corruption, money laundering or um, environmental scandals. Let's talk about one of the cases that your group has investigated in India. This actually has some parallels to this John Bowles case. And so that's the case of a small town journalist, a guy named uh, Jagendra Singh from the northern state of Uttar Pradesh. Tell us, tell us about him. Yes, Jagendra was killed in 2015. Uh, people set fire on him. And Jajendra was investigating one of the most dangerous stories uh, for journalists in India, which is the illegal sand mining. There is a lot of corruption in the mining industry, and a lot of politicians um, in India 
uh, can be corrupted by the companies to access this kind of market. And Judge Andra Singh was investigating this uh, in, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, and he was killed. So we decided to investigate not only who might be the killers, but also we did that to continue the work of Judge Andra, because we also do think that uh, the story and the case of Judge Andra is not only an Indian case, it's, a, it's also a French case, so an American case, because all that sand with, which is mined in India then is traveling all over the world, including to some US-based company or European-based companies. So this is... Uh, extremely important to work as a collaborative uh, um, newsroom to continue the work of um, assassinated uh, journalists like Judge Andra. And if I understand the story correctly, he had been investigating, as you said, illegal sand mining, but also sort of the links to local politicians, regional politicians who had allowed sand to be mined along this part of uh, a river in India illegally. Um, and that he actually you know, accused policemen of coming into his home, dousing him with kerosene, lighting him on fire. And as uh, those of you watching our video cast saw, he actually survived long enough to tell some of his story on videotape before he died. Yes, absolutely. He, I think he died like five, four, five days after after this. And uh, when we look at the video, we can have some uh, indication and information regarding who might be behind the killing and what was the last investigation Judge Andra was doing on a specific minister in this part of India who was uh, uh, allegedly uh, corrupted. So um, this is uh, this story is not um, is a very dangerous story and all the reporters in india in the same period of time in the very same uh, uh, two years after jajagor was killed all the reporters in india were killed uh, as they were investigating the same topic illegal sand mining and so tell us about what forbidden stories did to follow up on this reporting what what, what did you find when you sent sent your own journalists there so um, some of the journalists who are part of the group Forbidden Stories went on, they, they went on the field. And the first thing we did is to collect some evidence and some witnesses and to meet some witnesses to understand what happened exactly that day. Officially, Judge Andra uh, killed himself. According to the police version, according to the police statement, this was a suicide. But what we discover. So I'm sorry. That, so in spite um, of the fact the that minister, there's, in, in spite of the fact yeah. that there's videotape of him basically on his deathbed accusing specific people of 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 killing him, of lighting him on fire, the police instead concluded that he committed suicide by lighting himself on fire. Yes, absolutely. So officially, it was a suicide. Even if Judge Andrew was saying that he was uh, uh, attacked by by people on the video face to the camera but what we discover that the the relatives of the minister and the minister proposed some money uh, some settlement to silence the family of judge andra and uh, the daughter of uh, judge andra didn't want to sign anything any kind of agreement and just wanted the, to to fight for the truth uh, in the memory of uh, her father so so we collect that kind of witnesses, that kind of uh, new information, and uh, we also did investigate the environmental impact of that kind of industry on the on the coast of India, in India, on uh, on uh, on many aspects. And so, what's what's sort of the final outcome of this investigation? Has anyone been prosecuted for his killing? No, there is. Um, like um, in all the countries where you have a high number of uh, journalists who have been killed, there is a high level of impunity. So um, the family wants the truth, but there is uh, um, no more uh, official investigation as far as I know regarding the killing of Judge and Ra. I do hope that when we are doing this as an international journalist, we are sending a strong signal to enemies of the free press and to the people who might be the killer of Judge Andra, saying that if you want to kill the messenger, you will never kill the message. So what we are doing with Forbidden Stories is really also to trying to dissuade those who would like to kill some journalists to say, if the, the crime you want to hide in your town, we will expose 
this crime all over the world if you are um, doing something bad against any kind of journalist investigating your crimes. Well, Laurent Richard, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. This is Global Journalist. On today's program, we're learning more about threats to environmental journalists all around the world. We just heard from Laurent Richard of the Forbidden Stories Project. Up next, we're going to bring in one of the members of this investigative reporting collective. Joining us now from London is Juliette Garside. She's a reporter at The Guardian and a member of this investigative group who worked on its investigation in Guatemala. Juliette, welcome. Hello. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to have you here. As I mentioned, you were part of a team that reported on a large nickel mine uh, in Guatemala called the, the Phoenix Mine. Tell us just a little bit about this mine and how you got interested in it. So Phoenix is, is a nickel mine. It's one of the largest nickel mines in Central America. And it's owned by a company headquartered in Switzerland um, with Russian and Ukrainian ties. And so... Uh, how long has that mine been there? What sorts of environmental issues did were sort of upsetting people? Yeah, so the mine that had been dormant for a long time, uh, it first got going in the 60s and it was dormant all throughout the Guatemalan um, Civil War. Um, and then this company, Solway, uh, invested and reopened it. And the mine really got up and going in 2014. They're extracting um, ore and exporting it but they're also refining the ore, some of the ore a lot increasing amounts of the ore on site in a refinery the location of the refinery is really sensitive and actually of the overcast mines themselves they're right near lake isabel which is a, a beautiful freshwater lake um in in the mountains and uh, it is guatemala's largest freshwater lake and it's got many um, precious colonies of uh, manatees, uh, which is an aquatic mammal, and of crocodiles. So it's a very environmentally sensitive location. And I understand that your background, you worked on the Panama Papers investigation about uh, essentially tax tax avoidance, tax uh, uh, evasion by many prominent individuals. And one of, one of the stories that you did as part of this project focused on how little tax this international mining company actually pays to Guatemala. Yes, I did. So we, we, we came to this with as European journalists with some knowledge of uh, how to tear apart a, a balance sheet, how to look at the ways that companies try to avoid tax. And we, we applied what we'd learned from the Panama Papers to uh, the accounts and the, the filings of Solway Group. Uh, and we looked at how it was saving on tax. Um, and, and one of the ways it saves on tax is Guatemala has a royalties tax. So every bit of nickel that you take out of the ground is taxed. However, refined nickel is not. And so what Solway appears to be doing is selling the raw uh, nickel ore at rock bottom prices, which of course attracts rock bottom tax because it's charged as a percentage of, of what their revenues are, to a related company, to another sister company. It sells its ore at rock bottom prices to a sister company, and that sister company does the refining and then sells the ore at more of a market price. And I understand, I think you found that, so this is a, a fairly large mine uh, that's been there for several years. The past four years, it had paid something like the equivalent of 1.4 million British pounds, about $2 million in tax. And obviously, yeah. that's just a small fraction of their overall revenues. Yes. Yeah, so their revenues would be hundreds of millions. And the tax paid is a couple of million. And, and that covers both local and national taxes. So very, local people say they're feeling very little, they're receiving very little benefit from this. I mean, in, in, what I will say for Solway is they've created 2,000 jobs and more indirect jobs on top of that. Um, so they're a source of wealth for the local economy, but also of pollution. So you asked about pollution earlier. One problem is, is the immense amount of red dust kicked up by the mine, which um, is affecting uh, some of the Mayan villages nearby. So the Maya Kechi uh, live in the hills around and they, they find that their crops are being affected by the red dust. They're not, they're, their tomatoes won't grow, uh, their, their chili won't grow. And also um, the open cast is, uh, they say, affecting their water supplies because they don't have taps in many of these villages. They just rely on the streams and the rainfall. And they say that the mining is affecting the streams which are drying up. But um, things really kicked off in 2017 when a red stain, they called it a red stain, started to appear and billow out uh, across Lake Isabel from a point near the mine itself. And what the fishermen said was that 
the red stain was coming from the exit canal of a lagoon used to cool the chimneys of the refinery. The, the, the government and, and Solway deny this. Okay, so the fishermen then, it sounds like they, they saw this red stain on the lake. They saw that it was uh, appeared to originate from a canal um, where wastewater from, uh, from some of the mining operations occurred. So what, what did the fishermen do next? I mean, the mining company, the government said, oh, this isn't, this isn't a problem. This isn't a mining-related pollution. What, what, what happened? Well, they demanded proper scientific tests. They even carried out some of their own. Um, and uh, what they received in return was... Um, a rather kind of insulting offer. They were offered 10 chickens each to compensate for the loss of fishing revenue. And so um, they saw, they, they, they decided it, they needed to take direct action. They wanted answers about what was polluting the lake. The, the direct action took the form of a blockade. Um, so uh, 60, 70, sometimes up to 300 lorries a day are coming out of Phoenix going down to the Caribbean coast and the, laden with ore and refined nickel, which is being shipped out. So they block these lorries, which is obviously a major problem for Solway. Uh, it cut off the company's revenues for two weeks. So, so the ore started piling up at the refinery. Uh, the wives and children of the mine workers who live in a gated community were also um, under siege, effectively. They were blocked in by the blockade, so they couldn't exit and enter. Uh, the, miner, the miners carried on mining. They did carry on um, mining during this time. But um, local authorities came under huge pressure from politicians and from Solway itself to end the blockade. And that's when the shooting happened. OK, and talk to us about this shooting. I understand that it took place in 2017. Yeah. So in May 2017, uh, after two weeks of blockade and then a period of talks, which ended uh, without an agreement, the fishermen returned to, to begin the blockading again. Uh, and Carlos um, Choc, uh, who we see on screen now, uh, is a local journalist, uh, speaks Ketchi, um, and went with his camera uh, and his phone and, and went to the blockade. And just as he arrived, um, the police had been firing um, tear gas canisters, but just as he arrived, they started to fire live ammunition at the protesters. Uh, one of the members of the Fishermen's Union, a man called Carlos Maz, was about to throw a stone when he was shot in the chest uh, and he fell to the ground dead. Another fisherman uh, was running away from the scene, we think, because he was shot behind um, <coughs> uh, and he survived, but he, he still has medical problems. Um, instead of acknowledging the shooting, the police um, left the scene very quickly. Um, violence erupted in the town. Uh, the mayor's house was set on fire, so was the police station. And the other authorities, which is the Justice Ministry, refused to come and uh, confirm the killing. So oh, okay, so it sounds like so this killing was well. never investigated then, even though there was a journalist there, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Carlos Chuck, who took pictures while it was happening. He took pictures while it was happening. He, he had pictures of policemen holding um, glocks what appear to be Glock pistols, which is standard issue for the police. The police claim they weren't armed that day. He has pictures of them holding and, and pointing arms. But the, the key moment came when the national media started reporting the blockade and the violence. And they said they had heard that um, a fisherman had been killed, but the, the, the police were denying it. Well, what Carlos did was he was able to go on national television and say um, a, a fisherman was killed his name is Carlos Mass, and the police refused to acknowledge the killing or inspect the body. So Carlos had to go into hiding, um, uh, thanks to court action initiated by Solway itself. Um, he was labelled not a journalist. He was let, he was grouped in with the leaders of the Fishermen's Union and accused of being a trade unionist and accused of holding company workers hostage and being part of the blockade. Um, he was facing prison. And uh, he escaped from the court, was bundled into a car, taken to Guatemala City, and he was in hiding for a year. He couldn't see his two children for a year. He lost custody of his kids. So that's the point at which Forbidden Stories arrived. So we started working with Carlos and with his editors at Prensa Comunitaria, which is an excellent local media resource. And uh, we went back there and we started mapping out all the communities near the mine, many of whom don't appear on any official maps, but Carlos knows them. 
and he helped us create this map and he helped us meet them and interview them about the environmental impact of the mine. Uh, this was running concurrently with a legal challenge uh, brought by the local communities to say that they hadn't been consulted when the mining license was, uh, was uh, extended. Uh, and that was in breach of Guatemalan law. They won their case, but Solway had carried on mining. So they brought a new suit to say Solway must stop mining until they consult. And in July, they won a ruling from the Constitutional Court saying that Solway must stop its activities until it has consulted. Okay, so it sounds like a temporary, at least a temporary victory for, for the local people uh, that live there. But uh, I would encourage all of our audience, you can check out more about this story at uh, the website ForbiddenStories.org. Julia Garside, thank you so much for taking the time thank to you. join us. Lovely to talk to you. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about the dangers of doing environmental journalism. Up next, we're going to bring in Eric Friedman. And he's a researcher who studied this issue for a long time. He's also a veteran newspaper journalist who is now the Knight Professor in Environmental Journalism at Michigan State University. He joins us on the line now from East Lansing. Eric, welcome. Thank you, Jason. Well, talk to us just a little bit about what, what are some of the countries where these types of stories are particularly dangerous, where environmental journalists are threatened? Well, we tend to think of the problems in places like Brazil, Venezuela, Indonesia, Nigeria, where there's both corruption and poor legal protection for journalists. But environmental journalists in developed countries also have problems. In Canada, for example, a journalist was arrested several times and his equipment seized while covering fracking in, on First Nations uh, property in New Brunswick in the United States. Several journalists were arrested covering the Standing Rock uh, uh, reservation uh, protests against uh, a pipeline. So it can happen everywhere, but in the less developed countries, there tend to be fewer protections for environmental journalists, and there tend to be more severe sanctions and less public scrutiny elsewhere in the world that would apply pressure on governments not to be as repressive. And uh, I understand that you've also you've researched a number of other different cases in places like uh, Egypt and India. Talk to us about those. Sure. In India, a freelance journalist was reporting on the rose industry. The Indian rose industry grows a lot of its flowers in Africa. There were environmental problems. The owner of one of the companies protested to the news organization, which then fired the freelancer, took down her stories, and the owner of the company threatened to sue her for millions of dollars. She had no support from her news organization, but she did eventually get support from a journalist rights group based in London. In Egypt, a reporter who was investigating the dumping of toxic substances into the Nile was physically assaulted by thugs from a chemical company. So it can be legal threats, it can be physical threats, it can be assassination, it can be jail. Well, we mentioned at the top of the program that, uh, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, as many as 29 journalists were killed for working on environmental stories over the past decade. I think the number is at at least 13. There are 16 cases uh, which are still under review by that organization. Do you get the sense that this kind of work is more dangerous now than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago? It's more dangerous, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is that Traditional journalists for mainstream organizations in the West, newsrooms are being cut, staffs being cut. So some of this reporting that's going on are by citizen journalists or by bloggers who don't have any structure. They don't have a BBC or an Associated Press or a Washington Post to go to an embassy, to go to a foreign ministry and get their journalist out of trouble. Second is I think that the network of international companies that, that are involved in corrupt or illegal extraction of oil, of wood, of minerals, 
is growing in power because governments are less likely to regulate them and to go to remote places where forests are being cut down or where illegal gold mining or diamond mining takes place. So there's a change in the regulatory environment. But do you get the sense that also, I mean, are all of these people being threatened? In in some cases, it sounds like, are they journalists or in some cases, are they activists? And, and to what extent does it matter? I know that in a case uh, in Guatemala that we spoke about earlier on the show, the mining company, the government referred to the journalists who had been documenting protests against the mining company as as activists. It's a great question because a lot of uh, journalists or quasi-journalists or would-be journalists in non-Western countries are not professionals in training or in, in affiliation, and they view themselves as activists who are doing many of the things that traditional reporters do. But when a, let me give you an example. In Vietnam, for example, it's extremely difficult for foreign journalists to operate particularly doing investigative stories. So bloggers have replaced them, and the bloggers are Vietnamese citizens who are much more vulnerable. But there are alternative is a venue for providing information to the audiences at large. Uh, so it's difficult for many of them to separate those two roles. There's no barrier in their minds, no ethical difference in their minds between being an impartial objective journalist and being an advocate who uses communication tools that journalists traditionally used. Well, talk to us, if you would, what are some potential solutions to this issue? I mean, when we we talk about um, the number of journalists who have been killed, the far greater number who have been threatened or, or imprisoned for this kind of work, well, you know, what's, what's going to make things better? Yeah. I, well, I'm not an optimist. Uh, but I'm a realist on this. Certainly journalists who operate in remote areas, indigenous native land areas, need kind of security training and self-protection training that we're now giving journalists who go into war zones and conflict zones. Second, advocacy organizations, Committee to Protect Journalists, investigative reporters, reporters without borders need to reconsider their definition of journalists and, we, and, and expand them to include protection and advocacy for an intervention with those who aren't traditional professional journalists. And the third thing is, uh, and that I find optimistic, is that there are more collaborations among journalists in and out of these danger zones. So some of the resource problems and the protection problems that somebody operating alone in a developing country now can get assistance from journalists and networks, such as the Panama Papers Project, where there are outside professionals to keep an eye on you and have your back. So there is there is some reason for optimism, but uh, we're out of so, time. Yeah. For, well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist. Eric Friedman, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, Global Journalist is a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks again to Eric Friedman, Juliette Garside, and Laurent Richard for joining us. Our producer this week is Edom Kasaye. Takia Thomas is audio engineer, and Travis McMillan is director. Our executive editor is Kathy Keeley. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>